felt impelled to write my autobiography in 1845. I was one of the most eminent African American human rights leaders of the 19th century. My oratorical and literary brilliance thrust me into the forefront of the, the abolition movement, and I became the first black citizen to hold high rank in the US government. I am Frederick Douglass. And I am Harriet Tubman. And I was born in Dorchester, Maryland, somewhere around 1820 to 1821. But no one really knows, because see, I was born a slave. I fought my way to freedom. Once I was free, I lifted my hands to see if I was the same person now I was free. There was such a glory in everything, and I felt like I was in heaven. Some call me Moses. You know Moses from the Bible. Because I led over 300 of my people, including my own family, from the bondage of slavery down in the south to the free lands of the north, even as far as Canada. And I never lost the only navigational tool I had was the North Star. Me and my Underground Railroad became the most dominant force in abolitionism. And after I gained my freedom, I earned enough money to buy my family's home on over 25 acres of land. And I later turned that land, or turned that home into the home for aged and indigent colored people. And then after that, I turned it over to the American Methodist Episcopal Church, known as AME today. I lived to be over 90 years old, and I later retired to their home. I am Harriet Tubman. I am Sojourner Truth. That man over there say, women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best places everywhere. Nobody ever helped me into carriages or over mud puddles or gave me a best place. And ain't I a woman? <laughs> Look at me. Look at my arms. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns. And no man can have me. And ain't I a woman? <laughs> I could work as hard and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? <laughs> I have borne 13 children and seen most all sold into slavery. And when I cried out in mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? <laughs> that little man in black there say, women can't have as much right as a man because Christ wasn't a man, because Christ wasn't a woman. But where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. If the first woman God made Able, was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, then together, women ought to be able to turn it right side up. I am Sojourner Truth. <laughs> and I am Megger Evers. I was born July 2nd, 1925, in Decatur, Mississippi. I was a young black man who fought for my countrymen, both foreign and domestically. I was inducted into the U.S. Army when I was 18 years old and served in Normandy. I went on to Alcorn College, where I majored in business administration. I was listed in who's who in American colleges because of my academic accomplishments. In the early 1950s, I began to establish local chapters of the NAACP in Mound Bayou, Mississippi, where I lived with my wife. I organized many boycotts against the local gas station to allow blacks to use their restrooms. Despite being denied admissions into the University of Mississippi Law, for which I was fully qualified, I was appointed Mississippi's first field secretary of the NAACP. After I moved to Jackson, Mississippi, my wife and I set up an NAACP office from which I began investigating violent crimes committed against blacks and sought ways to prevent them. Though my life was short-lived, I did what I said I to do for my people. I was a part of the civil rights movement. I am Megger Wayland Evers. And I am Martin Luther King Jr. And I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation for they are not judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This is our hope, and this is the faith that I go back to the South with. <laughs> <laughs>
this faith, we'll be able to hew out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. With this faith, we'll be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we'll be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty we are free at last. I am Martin Luther King Jr. The dark side of white derived from the deep south. You see, they covered themselves as they galloped about. Do I love them, you say? <laughs> Anyways, you know, they killed my ancestors and burnt them out. And many that road had prestigious clout. Crosses they burnt, not a crucifix. But as a warning to our neighbors were stated, whose family's next? Fear became a way of life until some were forced to fight. Then came the hanging to break the black man's might. Although the cries are less, the dark side of white still seeks to be their best, to be that great wine press, to get my people's blood to rise, to reach the horse's eyes. You know, Revelation in the Bible mentions that day. But according to the prophets, it wasn't told that way. The dark side of white. Do I love them, you say? Anyways, yes, for I know the truth you see, and the truth has set me free. And the truth is simply this, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your father who sends his son to rise on the evil and good and send rain on the just and unjust. You see, they must have love from you and me. So that one day, they may finally see. And would you hurt anyone without sight? And yes, they can be loved with the love of Jesus Christ. A little, 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 a Now that concludes the first half of the Bethel Christian Church 2012 Black History Presentation. Oh. Oh yeah, oh yeah, huh. on a guitar. Huh. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I knew ya man in love. Huh. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I knew ya man in love. Huh. Oh yeah, oh yeah, huh. on a guitar. Huh. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I knew ya man in love. Huh. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I knew ya man in love. Huh. Oh yeah, oh yeah, huh. on a guitar. Huh.
Man, let's give him another hand. Let's give him a hand. Wasn't that an awesome presentation? Wasn't that awesome? Did you learn something this first half? I learned something this first half. We had all types of individuals that came before us that set the foundation for us here today. I'm so excited about what I've learned today. Hopefully you were just excited that you were able to learn something today. Because remember I said earlier, our young people are not learning any of this in school. I'm just finding out most of the time we have to learn this when we get to college. So unfortunately, we're not getting the history until we get older. So now that we have our young people here, they're able to learn this while they're five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way up to whoever want to be the oldest in here. We're all learning something new today. So that is a beautiful thing, seeing our young people yeah. given our African-American black heritage history. Ain't that right? That's a beautiful thing. Well, I want to say again, thank you, everybody, that you came to support this wonderful presentation. Again, they came to do this for you. They didn't want to do it for themselves. Even though they're learning something for themselves, they wanted to teach everybody what they're being taught. So we got a few people that were going to come up today, but I have a, I just learned something today. I was sitting in the back talking to my good friend, uh, Michael Shoecraft, and he just told me a little bit of history about himself. Two things. He was talking about, we were talking about earlier about Allensworth. And for those who were a little late, Allensworth was the only city, is the only city in California community to be founded, financed, and governed by African Americans. It was created by Allen Allensworth in 1908 in a town that was built with the intentions to establish a self-sufficient, all-black city where African Americans could live there free from ra racial discrimination. Now, Michael Shoecraft told me his grandfather actually has a farm in Allensworth, California, and he did not know that the history where he's coming from, they used to go down there every year to see their grandfather. So that was amazing for him to understand the history where his grandfather is from. He may have, his family may be part of the founding fathers or founding, fa you know, there from that, that wonderful city. And he also told me one more other thing, that his father, his father, Fred Shoecraft, was the first black superintendent in the Washington State for union construction workers. So again, we got history everywhere around us, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now I do have a couple more did you know facts. And I, again, these are some facts that I did not know, and I'm sure most of you may not know unless you are a history buff. And I'm going to see if you guys know some of these. Now, let me say, did you know musician and activist Harry Belafonte originally devised the idea for We Are the World? Oh, some people did know that. Yeah, it wasn't Michael Jackson. Harry Belaf Belafonte, a single that he hoped would help raise money for famine relief in Africa. And as we know, that single became the fastest selling in history, making more than $20 million worldwide. That is a lot of money for them to raise for Africa. So Harry Belafonte, he was the originator of that. So now you know some of the facts. Now here's another one. This one that got me, and I know some people know this as well. In 1938, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt challenged the segregation rules in the Southern Conference on human welfare in Birmingham, Alabama. The reason why she challenged that, so she can sit next to her African-American educator, Mary McLeod Bethune, who she referred to her as her closest friend in her age group. Isn't that something? First Lady Roosevelt challenged the Southern Party, I'm gonna call, because they were want to be segregated and all that. She challenged them so she could sit to her good friend was the same age, Mary McLeod Bethune. Ain't that something? Now that's some history that not, not too many people know. Now here's another one for you. This is for you parents. This is a good one. I, when I was reading this, I was like, oh, this, is, this is a pretty awesome. Now when neosurgeon Ben Carson was a child, his mother required him to read two library books a week and give her written reports even though she can barely read. She was, in, she was not literate. She would then take the paper and pretend to carefully review the item, <laughs> placing check marks at the top of the page, showing she was approving it. And then, and then the assignment gave Carson his eventual love of reading and learning. A neosurgeon, mother that could not read or write. But he became a neosurgeon because his mother encouraged him to read books. 
and write about what he was reading so she can learn, but she actually was growing a leader within him. Wow. Now, parents, yeah. encourage your children to do the exact same thing. Our children should be reading books, not in front of the TV. The TV should not be their book. Video games should not be their book. Again, if we want our kids to be leaders, if we want our kids to be strong, we have to build the inside up, okay? So I want this to be an encouragement to our parents. Get them in the books, not in front of the television, okay? I'm going to give you one more, and then we're going to move on. One more. Now, here we go. Who knows who Nat King Cole is? You got a lot of people know that. Okay, we got some Nat King Cole fans in here. All right. Revenue from the musician Nat King Cole record sales financed a majority of Capitol Records success during the 1950s, so much so that the distinctive Capitol Records building in Los Angeles became known as the house that Nate built. He was making that much money for a record label, and he's building them up. Not that he was getting built up by them, he was building them up. So that's a beautiful thing that, again, our leaders that we have that came before us are able to bring forth the inner strength in them to do bigger and better things that we would even not even imagine. But you know what? We can imagine those things because people have done it in the past, and I guarantee you these young people that are here in the stands or in the back can do just as that. So, I'm, again, I, I want to be an encouragement, encouragement to our parents first because, again, if it isn't for the parents to upbring our children, to make sure they're going in the right direction, as the Bible says, you know, we want to make sure they're going in that straight and narrow path. But again, it's education is key for their success. So let's remove them from certain situations, television, video game, and let's get them to know who they are. Because again, that's the beauty for what tonight is they're learning who they are and where they come from. Now, what I'm going to have a few people I'm going to bring up, the next young person I'm going to bring up, Today, she's going to be doing Madam C.J. Walker, some parts of her, I to Sing America, and Young, Gifted, and Black. This young lady has not been here more, well, she has been here more than one time. Every time she comes, she rocks it. She's awesome. She has a great mother who is a, a producer herself. She made, uh, she's already made a few movies herself, which her name is Nation. So again, we're encouraging our people here that are doing bigger and better things to keep doing what they're supposed to do. So without any further ado, let's put our hands together for Miss DeAsia Gray as she comes up. I too sing America by Langston Hughes. I am the darker brother. They tell me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh, ha, huh. I eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow when company comes, I will be at the table. No one will, deal. No one will dare tell me to eat in the kitchen. Besides, these, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too sing America. <laughs> What a lovely, precious dream it is to be young, to be gifted, and to be black. Open your heart to what I mean, to be young, to be gifted, and to be black. Open your heart to what I mean, to be young, to be gifted, and to be black. There are a billion boys and girls in the world, you know, that are young, that are gifted, and that are black? We must begin to tell our young that theirs is the quest that has just begun. And when you're feeling really low, there's a great truth that you should know. When you are young, when you are gifted, and when you are black, your soul is intact, your soul is intact. I said, when you are young, gifted, and black, and that your soul is intact, and that's a fact. I am Nina Simone. I am Aretha Franklin. I am Soul Music, and I am Black History. Mm -hmm. 
I was born, said breathe love. My parents were slaves and they died. An epidemic that killed so many of my people. To support myself, I had to become a washerwoman and the work was hard and the pay was very low. The harsh life soap damaged my hands and my skin and my hair. And a woman's hair, her hair was her glory and mine was gone because of the harsh conditions of poverty. I prayed to God, I said, God, you've got to help me. And you know what he did? And I became wealthy. I gave money to Booker T. Washington of the famed Tuskegee Institute. I also gave money to the YWCA to help all the little orphan children since I was one myself when I was little. I am the first black woman millionaire before Oprah Winfrey was the first black woman billionaire. I am an entrepreneur. I am a businesswoman. I am Adam C.J. Walker, and I am Black History. I love it when she comes because she be, she's only nine years old and I was talking with her a little earlier and her mom and uh, she was a little discouraged for a little bit and then we had to encourage her to get her back up here because uh, she felt that her part was already said and done earlier but I was like you've been doing this for so long she's been working on those parts since she was six years old so she knows what she's talking about so she is young gifted in black. Now, I do have a couple more people I'm going to bring up, but I, I got a couple more facts for you. A couple more facts. See where your head is at. Now, let me ask you, let me tell you this. W.E. Du Bois and William Marone, Tr Marone Trotter started the Niagara Movement. I know some of you may know that. A black history rights organization, which got its name from the group's first meeting located in Niagara Falls. This collective later, collectively later became NAACP. Okay, so the Niagara Movement became the NAACP because of these two wonderful individuals. Now, this one also got me. I had some people laughing because of uh, the name of it, but Nancy Green, a former slave, which was who was employed in 1893 to promote the Antia Mima brand by demonstrating the pancake mix at expositions and fairs. She was a popular attraction because her friendly personality, great storytelling, and her warmth. Green signed a lifetime contract with the pancake company, and her image was used on the packaging and the billboards. So who you see there is not Aunt Jemima, 